and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tjolf Simpson. And um, Tjolf studied medicine at the University of Bochum, but uh, in Germany, but also he studied uh, uh, in Switzerland and in the UK. And between 2000 and 2003, uh, Dr. T.L. Simpson worked as a postdoc postdoctoral scientist at the um, Max Planck Institute for Neurobiology in Martin Street in Germany. During this time, his main research focus was on uh, neuroimmunological topics using animal experimental and clinical approaches. After his return to Dresden in 2004, he established a neuroimmunological laboratory. Two years later, in 2006, Dr. Simpson founded uh, the Multiple Sclerosis Center in Dresden. Currently, as far as I understand, he remains a practicing clinician and, a, at the same time, uh, a director at the Center of Clinical Neuroscience at the TU Dresden. Today, Dr. Simpson is going to talk about digital twin in healthcare, the use, the use case multiple sclerosis. Uh, well, with this, and yeah. without any further ado, uh, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. Thank you, organi the organizers, Carlos Organizing, for giving me the possibility. Yes, I, I did clinic, so I, I, uh, I had already 30 patients today, and I'm, I'm very happy that I'm now talk to you without a mask, yeah, which is, of course, the current procedure we have at the moment. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because I um, that's why I liked uh, with, uh, uh, to have this tandem talk with uh, Professor Neumuth from Leipzig, because he, is, he has the other perspective, more from the technical point of view. I'm more now the medical perspective, which I think it's, uh, it's important as well. So to uh, introduce a little bit, so MS, it's um, a neurological disease. It's an still uncurable, disabling disease. Um, you can see it's, uh, it's uh, worldwide prevalence is around 2.3 million. Usually young, young adults are diagnosed. Um, inflammatory lesions can appear in any at any place in the brain. That's why it can induce a variety of uh, um, of disorders. That's why it's caused a disease of a thousand faces, which of course is very nice for a digital twin. You can feel already, yeah. And the other thing is that the prognosis of the patient, if they are not treated right, is not good. Yeah. So fifty percent of the patients they 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 develop walking disabilities, and the typical think you think about an MS patient as a wheelchair yeah and of course that that has significant cost perspective as well and here's a little bit what happens in the brain so the the healthy nerve the isolated healthy nerve uh, fiber in the brain is attacked by the own immune system so it's an autoimmune disease and this process le leads them to the different symptoms you can see on the right side and um, because this process is an ongoing process, if you don't stop them with uh, medication, of course, we have a significant problem that um, it's progressing and the patient will develop significant neurological deficits. There have been a lot of developments over the year. I will not bore you with the details. So we have in uh, before nine, uh, uh, um, 1900, you can see the disease was treated by arsenic and strychnine. And now we have a lot of... Um, uh, um, uh, therapies that makes, of course, our life more difficult because we have a disease which is still uncurable, but we have treatment options available. And now the question is how we can uh, find the right proof, uh, the right treatment for the right patient. So that's a little bit um, our uh, our our dilemma we have. So it's not a disease still with two treatments, but it's now like a chess game where we have to think about so which players we can use to treat um, the disease uh, multiple sclerosis in this um, context. Yeah, here you to give you an estimate, that is a graph demonstrating the disability of a patient developing MS from the beginning and what happens over the next 30 years. Yeah, and the EDSS of zero is a patient has no neurological problems. EDSS of 10 is patient has died of, uh, of MS. And you can see 
Yeah, it's a very difficult disease because you can see there is an increase in disability, but but on the individual level, it's 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 practical uh, and not possible to monitor and to predict the disease. And that's of course very bad if you have a young patient sitting in front of you and, and you don't know what will happen in 20 years. It's not so much like in the oncology where the next year will be the crucial year where you can defeat the cancer, but it's more an ongoing chronic process which is the challenge for us in, uh, in daily care. And the problem is um, we had, we were very happy that, that we had drugs available to treat this disease, but then the process started, okay, one drug is for all, all patients with this disease. So the target is the disease or evidence-based medicine we are using, but evidence-based medicine doesn't help us a lot for treating the individual patient. And that's why we have to go back to good old Hippocrates. So every good talk of a, of a physician should contain um, a, a sentence of this uh, famous first physician in, in our area here in Europe. It's far more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. So it's, it's not so much linked anymore to the disease, but it's more linked to the um, really to the phenotypical um, characterization of the individual patient. And what we would like to have as soon as we have now more and more treatment options available, we would not like to go like trial and error as we did before. We would really like to go to a personalized approach to find the right treatment for the, uh, for the individual patient. Yeah? Now, what can we do? Yeah, and I think we can learn a lot from other fields. And one field where we can learn from is, of course, oncology. Yeah, because in oncology, if you go 60 years ago, there was looking at, for example, the disease of cancer of the blood. Yeah, so lymphoma, leukemia, it was just the disease of the blood. And if you can see over the time, as of today, yeah, so we have a lot of different phenotypes, genotypes of leukemias, of lymphomas. And this is, of course, associated with a significant increase of the survival of this disease. So we have to phenotype, um, we have to phenotype the, the disease first. And then because we have a phenotype or genotype of the disease, we can move forward and we can apply uh, modern technology um, to improve then the outcome of our patients. That means, especially in the field of MS. So that MS is not as it's understood by most of the uh, most of our colleagues. It's one disease. Yeah, but that is not true. If you look very careful um, at your patients, and I will show you a little bit in the in the uh, uh, what does it mean? How you can collect data? Yeah, to fill in to characterize the patient. That by profiling patients, you realize that the disease is different um, from patient to patient. And we have an individual um, phenotype of the disease. But this is, of course, a challenge um, because at the moment, um, so it's very hard to collect all this data, as I will show you in the minute. So that's why phenotyping MS is crucial. And we have to collect multidimensional parameters, which is, of course, very crucial for, um, for creating then a digital or a virtual um, um, picture, uh, a virtual twin of the patient. And especially in the, in the field of multiple sclerosis, of course, we, we need clinical data. We need par clinical data. We, of course, have to use uh, multi-omics data, which includes the genetics. Yeah? Then we have so-called uh, patient-derived data, so patient-reported outcomes or patient-reported experience or other contextual, contextual parameters, which are crucial um, for phenotyping, um, uh, for putting the disease together. And um, I think it's very important for us clinicians because if we, if we don't have something we, we cannot measure, then it cannot be put into a system. And that's a challenge we have in the field of multiple sclerosis. So at the moment, we have, of course, one scale we could use, but um, uh, you, cannot, you cannot feed um, the, the system you would like to generate just with gut feeling of neurologists, which is just uh, 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 not a concrete um, um, outcome. That's why I think, first of all, what we have to learn is um, really to make um, a lot of things, um, the, the, the different phases of multiple sclerosis uh, measurable. 
Yeah, and one thing is, for example, as I have said to you, so walking is one uh, particular thing, but walking usually, uh, the assessment of walking in neurology usually functions, uh, functions in that way, that the neurologist is looking at the patient and then giving the diagnosis. But of course, that is not working there. That's why we have developed now in the past year, the Dresden protocol of multidimensional walking assessment, where we analyze different uh, parameters of walking. You can see on the right side in the, in the figures, you can see um, um, the technology we are using there. So we have a gate ride system and we have a mobility lab system where we can measure what is going around. And then what is very important, then you can see here on the left side, you get first, uh, uh, first in time, you get a dashboard which shows you the different results and the outcome over time. And um, this information then for the first time, and that's the paper on the right side, I would like to show you. Then of course we have to, provide this information back to the patient because a patient at the end has to understand has to give feedback so what is really what is really the outcome and this i think this combination of implementing new digital stuff then bringing it to clinical practice and on the other side to get the patient feedback i think that is crucial and um, really to 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 uh, develop content to be filled um, in the digital twin yeah. Another thing, for example, um, we have set up is that we have uh, the patient before he's seen by me uh, as a neurologist. So he's checking, he's doing a self-test, um, which is provided on an iPad. Yeah. So first of all, the patient, uh, after he has, he has, he has been, um, uh, he has come to our center. So he does a questionnaire and then several uh, um, cognition tests or vision tests and, and walking tests he does by himself. And the data we have there, they are provided to me. And of course, they are filled in, in the, into the digital twin as well. Or other technologies we are using here, for example, and we can use a lot of um, digital biomarkers, which can be used and implemented in systems. And especially for a disease like multiple sclerosis, where you have symptoms developing differently and from day to day. It's very crucial that we have the possibility to, to collect data over uh, a continuous, uh, continuously over a long period, because otherwise everything is only limited to the consultation of the physician. And then a lot of information is lost because the patient will not, uh, will not remember what is happening there. That's why I think it's very crucial um, um, to collect data and, and to have tools available even to get this information from the from the patient home and we have for example an app we are using where the patient is for example encouraged to do the neurological test every day so we are learning how it's possible to collect this information how to reimburse a patient for this how to re-encourage the patient to get this and i think um, with this we get a very nice picture around um, so what is what is happening um, even if the patient is not in our center? Then we developing, for example, cognition test. Cognition plays a significant role. And again, it's very important that the patient himself can do the testing and that not a neuropsychologist um, where we don't have a lot of uh, people to do this test um, can be used to, to implement it. And on the other side, of course, imaging. We are now moving from the clinical markers to imaging. So MRI plays a significant role. We can see um, what is um, we can see CMS lesions in this context. We can measure a lot of parameters. And what we have implemented in our center that we have really a standardized imaging and a, and an imaging report which provides you with uh, which provides you with the critical information. So we are collaborating with Siemens on this. And that is, for example, here an example of an MRI report, which of course looks much different than, but you, you are of course not familiar with MRI reports, but usually MRI reports is a lot of text, a lot of narrative, and the neurologist explains everything. Here we have really numbers. So we can see, so for example, what is the, um, here we can see, um, what is the, um, what is the volume of the lesions in the brain? where the brain lesions are. Yeah? So what is the brain volume? Yeah? So what is the brain volume in comparison to the, um, to the normal standard brain volume? Uh, we are looking at gray matter volume, white matter volume. So we have a lot of information we can feed into a system, yeah? like uh, for example, our digital twin, and we get information on this. 
but it's um, of course crucial that um, because our standard database, so we have, for example, Orbis and Dresden, they, this, info, this information could not be stored in a, in, a, in a simple health information system. So you have to create your own infrastructure to collect this information. And we are working on this for the last 20 years or so, um, that we have uh, capabilities to, uh, to, uh, to, um, um, to uh, um, store this information in a system where, we, where this information is available for other things. And here, for example, not only the clinical, not only the MRI information, but um, in MS, um, the genetic information is not so much important as, for example, some immunological, the immunomics or the metabolomics, which play a significant role. And again, this information um, has to be integrated as well. And, then, and that is ongoing work, then it, of course, has to be um, um, analyzed by neural networks or by other, by other uh, tools which are able to, um, to dissect the information which is there. What is very important for us, it's not only that our infrastructure includes data, but procedures are very important. If you remember, if you go to a physician, the, 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 the order and, or the time in between different examinations is crucial. And we would like to have a system which is able to improve the quality. So that is the standard process, what a digital twin should do. Yeah? So that if you have a workup, so that this procedure is improved, the monitoring is improved. And that's one of our key works. So we have, uh, we have for the first time uh, developed in the MS care digital clinical pathways, which are able to collect this information and, and bring this information into a digital format. And you can see here, for example, on the, on the left side, that is one example. So how, for example, the, the one pathway, and we have very complex pathway, especially if you are coming to treatment. So what is, uh, what is happening? And we have then different levels, uh, really a network where, which you can see on the right uh, uh, page, where all this information um, could be included. And especially this digital pathway, which are integrated, of course, in, a, in an infrastructure is of course quite important because on the one side, you can link data with procedures, which is usually good. You can, you can especially with multi-dimensional data, it's good because you can, you can put this in, uh, in, in, pers in, 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 in you can connect the data with each other. On the other side, it's especially in the long lasting chronic cause, it's very important and you can provide this information, which is stored there, you can provide um, to the treating physician and to the patient. And that is, that is I think, an important way um, to move forward. Yeah. And, this is, for example, integrated in a digital patient portal. So the patient has, for example, the chance um, to look at his own data. And by the data provided by this digital pathway, um, it's not only used by the, by the physician himself, but we have really a treatment tandem of um, physician, other um, healthcare providers, and the patient to really ensure that the um, care is the best one uh, we, can, we can have there. And that is the idea. Um, we have a quality management project, which is just ongoing, an EFRA project, together with our colleagues at, 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 at Theo Dresden. Um, so where our vision is really to have one digital infrastructure, which can be used by physician and um, patient, um, really to move forward. And that is, of course, a very, a very important component, especially if we are moving to um, um, to the field of digital twin. And what does it mean is, for example, here, if you come to a patient visit, it's like, uh, it's like if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're flying, yeah? so you have a check-in, a digital check-in before, um, you get all your information, you are asked, so what are your questions, what should be done there? Then the patient visit takes place with all the examination, and then you have a check-out system where all the study results are presented and, and you get the information, which is crucial. And of course, all this information is then stored in one system um, where we have the data and the procedures. And that is, of course, uh, for us the pre prerequisite um, to really improve the daily, uh, the, the daily care and the treatment of the patient. Because only if we have profile patient, as you can see here, and when we have collected data, how these patients are treated and what are the treatment outcomes, 
we can move forward to a personalized treatment, which I think is cl a clue for our, yeah, for our individualized approach for the patient. And now I think it's it's very easy to be understood why we why we thought that the digital twin is the right one. Because if you go to industry and you and uh, we have uh, we have heard already excellent talks um, 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 uh, before. Um, so how digital twins can really innovate production processes, science, and all, all things like that. Um, it's very it's very easy to understand that um, the best way, if you have a lot of information on data uh, and procedures in a chronic condition, yeah, the best one is really, and you would like to take the patient with you. Um, it's a it's a it's a good idea um, to put this information in a format um, which uh, which provide there as a digital twin and I will show you the advantages um, quite soon. So you are you are already experts in this because that's why I, I pro probably I don't have to iterate it. You know it from the from the other uses um, out of uh, out of uh, medical science. Yeah, how you can how you create the process so you. Uh, you aggregate data, analyze data, then have an analytics and this plays inside um, the system back. And that's the same thing, for example, we are planning or we are on the way in medical science, especially in a chronic conditions uh, like multiple sclerosis. So this cycle, which is possible by implementing the digital twin. And that is here's the idea and the construct we are, we are building at the moment. Of course, it's it's uh, it's of course a big challenge, and that's why I have uh, I have shown you in the in the first major part of my presentation how difficult it is really to make things measurable and to to have really to have really data and procedures which could be collected because most of the information in in medical science um, they are not available so much, and if you have not uh, information which cannot be yeah, digitized, um, I think it's a significant problem. So, so first of all, what is the first step? Of course, this innovative way of data collection, data from patient, data from physician, data from other physicians, then integrating this personalized clinical pathways, then integrate the patient and other HCPs. For example, integrate the physiotherapist, integrate, for example, the GP, it's very important then integrate NMS dashboard. So that is, I think it's a very nice um, development of a, of a digital twin that you can look at the, at, your, at the digital twin and you can select so which information you would like to see. And that is, for example, a big problem that, that all this information to be available and to find ways how to visualize this information, it's, um, it's, not, um, it's not available at the moment. And then, of course, what is a crucial thing of course, if you have a data set, if you analyze this data to have a clinical decision support system to say, for example, I, I would like to use um, this treatment in this specific situation because I have simulated before that I could go in that way. I think that will that is able to change, um, hopefully, um, our, our, um, um, our clinical habits. So where we are. So at the moment, we are, we are, challenged, we are, we are in this stage um, that we that we improve to collect our parameters. Of course, we have already data and uh, uh, um, parts of the data are already analyzed. Of course, we have still to solve a lot of uh, a lot of this issue, especially um, data privacy, security. If the system is working in our setting, of course, it's um, it's a different thing because um, because we have uh, we have a clear data safety plan. But of course, if it's moving outside um, the system of our university clinic, of course, it's um, it's getting difficult. And then, of course, things like how to visualize data, how to present data, how to um, how to adapt the data presentation to the individual need of the patient or of the physician who is using the system. Yeah, and then of course at the end, of course, um, the implementation in clinical practice. I think it will take some some time. But on the other side, we have to start again, and we have to go this step um, by collecting parameters and creating um, um, the database and implementing the algorithm and the learning health system before we can use it into clinical practice. So our vision is that that in some years, um, so the patient together with the with the physician. Um, get some hints um, how the uh, how the treatment of this chronic disease 
um, um, can be improved. So what steps are necessary to go for it? And um, in this context, and that is at least the feedback we, we have from our patients and from our colleagues, I think that is a very nice tool how, how um, this uh, digital twin, which we bought from other um, disciplines, I think it's very helpful. And here to state, especially the chronic disease where we have to, to uh, accompany a disease for the next 20 and 30 years, where you accumulate enormous amounts of data, where especially the procedures and the quality of these procedures is crucial. Um, I think it's quite important and that's why we are moving forward. And here you can see all our activities where we, where we have it here, where we collect the data. Yeah, and um, that's from my position. Thank you very much for, for your patience, listening, and happy to answer questions. And I think it was quite nice now to have the medical perspective, how the digital twin can help us physicians um, very much in this science as well. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Jelf. I've so I'm going to open the floor to the questions right now, and I already see one question from uh, Ivo. Please go ahead. Hi, Ivo. Yes. Hey, Jelf. Nice. Very nice talk. Excellent work. Congratulations. Um, I don't have a question, but I have um, um, a remark potentially for a collaboration because we are working Absolutely. on a very, yeah. <laughs> a very similar system at the moment, um, also with an app uh, where the patient can record symptoms and also medication and a web portal for the clinicians to enter molecular diagnostics data. Um, and then we want to couple it with meteorological data and uh, data from pollen measurements because we are targeting pollen allergies. Ah, okay. We want to uh, set up a system actually together with the uh, German Union of um, Allergologik, so that okay, I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the uh, um, uh, Deutsche Verband der Allergologen uh, in Wiesbaden, um, where people can have um, an app that will basically tell them in the morning how many pills they should take. Of um, because they know they know everything about the weather and the, uh, because they know the weather, they know the pollen concentration in the air, they know your molecular composition and so on, and they know how you have been feeling in the past days. Um, no, I so think I think it's a it's it's a great idea, and I think I think as you do it, um, and that probably I, I I haven't told. I think it's good if we do it, and if we don't let Google or other other companies do it, because of course it's very much in their interest, and that's why I think initiatives, and especially I think you have of course then even different data available. You have patient derived data as well, but you you're adding all the allergology story to this. I think it would be very interesting to um, to exchange about this and to find probably a way, um, like we do, for example, with the ECAS colleagues in 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 Leipzig, to find ways of how we could exchange and um, that we don't have to invent the wheel um, for the for the second or for the third time. Yeah, exactly. Because we need we need the database servers, the secure ones. We're actually working also with a lawyer that is an expert in data. Uh, uh, security laws, and we are working with a professional software company for producing. Oh, that would be good. I think, especially. Uh, let's have lunch together at some point. Why don't you yeah. come over to the CSPD and we have lunch? Yeah. Absolutely. Would be nice. Excellent. Thank you. I'll send you an email. Oh, even I, I, the, the result of my talk is now already a lunch, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. It's great to see uh, Casas Workshop to be the forum for collaborations. I think there is another question from uh, Marco Jata Vogdan. Please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the, the talk was really great. Uh, I just wanted to mention maybe one more platform where the data could be collected, like wearable, wearable accelerometers. Yeah. They are, that are, that are now frequently used, like in stage, for example, particularly for these types of diseases. Yeah. So have you been thinking of incorporating this um, type of data? We have um, we have in the walking analysis in our center, so we are using acelerometer. So the patient has um, uh, carries during the analysis seven acelerometer, and in one project we have, um, for example, the patient has a smartwatch as well. But but the issue, for example, we did we did a very careful um, business case, and we ask our patient so how many times, for example, how common it is that you have a smartwatch. And among our our um, patients, for example, only two to three percent of our patients had a smartwatch. And that's why, so we wanted to have a solution which is um, available for all patients. That's why we get this information from the accelerometers from the smartphone. 
Yeah, but but in particular, so I'm a big fan of smartwatch, and uh, you can get a lot of interesting data from this. But um, but at the moment, I think it's it's not um, the challenge is that that it could not be put to clinical practice because the patient the patients they don't have this they don't using this infrastructure. I think totally right, but at least I, I don't know the situation as in Europe, but, but in Saxony, um, um, so only among our patients, I think only a very small minority has this, and that's why uh, it's very difficult to integrate it, because uh, you, uh, you would have to provide smartwatches to all of them, and um, they would be a little bit expensive. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So I, I know, you know, like my colleague, uh, Jarosław Halezlak, he will give a talk on Friday and he, they work extensively on using uh, accelerometry. It will be very interesting. I will look forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I don't see any more questions, but I actually have got a couple of questions myself, if you don't mind. Um, you've mentioned a few words about the, the um, privacy, data privacy and security, and obviously, uh, given the uh, most recent trends and, and, and you know, importance of the subject altogether, and especially since uh, clinical data is even more sensitive than anything else. Uh, I wonder what are your thoughts on, on uh, perhaps going direction privacy, of privacy preserving machine learning as well when you train your models. And another question, if I uh, may st uh, straight away, uh, is, I happened myself to to look in a little bit into the literature of uh, calculating the EDSS score myself, and I realized that it was a giant mess with yeah, a lot of different ways to, yeah. <laughs> with a lot of ways to do this. So along these lines, what do you think are the uh, implications for for creating more international standards? For yeah, this? probably, probably, probably to start with this. Um, so neurologist, it's um, um, neurologist is a very conservative discipline in medicine. Yeah. So, so usually, usually, um, so it's very hard for neurologists to have treatments available because we have all the time we have been the intellectual people to diagnose diseases, but not to treat. Yeah. And uh, and on the other side, I think to integrate really new technology, it's very it's very slow, and that's why we have a score like. What you mentioned, the EDSS, which is very old school and uh, not very helpful in clinical practice. And what we are doing now, we have now to substitute um, such a score by digital outcomes. And the big problem is, so of course you can, in, in some studies it's accepted, but we have our major obstacle is that the, um, that the um, regulators are not accepting anything else as EDSS. So if you come, for example, to the EMA or to the FDA, they would like to have this all scores. And um, the big problem is if you have new endpoints, it's probably as complicated to establish and validate this uh, endpoints um, as you would like to introduce a new clinical treatment, yeah, so a new drug, yeah, and that is of course a challenge. And there, of course, we have to fight to develop algorithms and to develop um, processes or procedures which makes it more easy to in, uh, to enter new outcomes. And that I think in all fields of medicine that is crucial, yeah, um, really to optimize it. Then for your first thing, I think it's a very good idea. And um, the big problem is that. We have, of course, different instances. Of course, of course, a patient should be um, should uh, should be able to use um, uh, or to to assess um, or to access his own data. But on the other side, I think it's very helpful if this information is then, for example, available to the GP or to the physiotherapist as well. But on the other side, is it really logical that that the, that the GP gets all the information, or could it be limited to? some degree and that's why I think your, what you propose really to have a system which is really um, adaptive and which really um, is able to deal with the individual needs of the patient I think that is that is that is helpful and we could for example imagine a system for example even our dashboard could be could be adapt to the need of the patient so you know that there are um, AI um, possibilities yeah that that AI could drive um, the presentation of data. So if you realize, oh, Dr. X is there, um, the data will be presented in that way. And if you have Dr. A, then the data will be presented in that way. And I think that's why I think even the availability of the data and the data security, I think um, we have to go into this um, complex uh, features because 
um, because it's necessary for to, this individualization is necessary because of data security. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, I think there's still some time left. So if there are more questions, please, uh, please go ahead. If that's not the case, I would like to thank Dr. Simpson once again uh, for this wonderful talk. And we probably I'll uh, pass it on to Philip to continue our program. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Arthur.